Last week was the 40th anniversary of Rocky, the greatest underdog movie of all time. So, let's celebrate by looking at some underdogs. Before we get to week 13, week 12 was awesome. I mean, Kansas City continues to plummet like a homemade rocket ship, and we saw the return of the Jacksonville roller coaster, but other than that, there were some pretty great picks. As I mentioned, Jacksonville bombed on me, but Tennessee figured it out, they came through in the clutch, and then we had the Grey Cup, the CFL championship game, and I looked like I was going to be a genius, taking Calgary minus 7.5 plus to win, it was going to be great, so they blew an 8 point lead in the fourth quarter. So kudos to Ricky Ray, quarterback of Toronto. I remember interviewing that dude in like 2004 when I was still in radio school. First athlete that I ever got a chance to interview and he's still balling out winning championships 13 years later. So yeah, one and two on the point spread for last week, but straight up, seven and one. And that was just the video. If you checked all of my picks at Instagram and Twitter, I went 14 and two for the entire week, including crushing three for three on Yankee Thanksgiving. So here's hoping that won you some money like it won me some money. On the season, I'm now up to 122 and 54, a 69% pick rate and tied for second with the experts from all across the internet at NFLPickWatch.com. This week though, I'm either gonna look like a genius or a fool because like I said off the top, each team that I'm recommending in this video is getting points according to the Sports Select point spread. Atlanta has pretty much been two completely different teams so far this season. After a 3-0 start against some easy teams, they dropped games to Buffalo and Miami, dropped another one to Carolina and then lost big time against New England in a Super Bowl rematch. They've won three in a row now, and some people are starting to say, ah, there's Atlanta, that's the team we were expecting. They are back and headed for the top. They beat Dallas without Zeke and Smith, Seattle without Sherman or Chancellor, and Tampa Bay without Winston and Martin. When you say it out loud, it suddenly really isn't that impressive. Meanwhile, Minnesota has racked up seven in a row, leading the NFC North, and Case Keenum, who everybody is looking for an excuse to write off every week, including Minnesota, is 11th in the league for quarterback rating neck and neck with number 10 Matty Ice from Atlanta. The defense is the bell of the ball in Minnesota. There's no question about that. That's why they're winning. But they also have a top six rushing attack, which means that clock management is just a thing that they own on both sides of the ball. People always like to say that a team on a winning streak is due for a loss. And yeah, I mean, that's true. Eventually, a team is going to lose, but does that mean that it's necessarily going to be here? I just don't think so. Especially if you're gonna tell me that I can have the fifth best defense in the NFL, and you're gonna give me points, I'm gonna take those points. I'm locking in Minnesota at plus 2.5 against the spread, and honestly, I think this is eight in a row. I'm taking them to win on pro line, especially with those tasty odds. Okay, now after waxing poetic about Minnesota's great defense, let's talk about a team that managed to, not completely, but somewhat, solve it. Too little too late, mind you, but still, they put up points. On Yankee Thanksgiving, Detroit went down 27 to 10. They would fire back up and get to within four points before Minnesota finally put the game away. And there was a late pick, which of course is just that Minnesota defense doing Minnesota defense things. But the fact of the matter is, Detroit put up 23 against the fifth best defense in the league last week. And the truth is, 23 points is enough to beat or at least force overtime against Baltimore more often than not this season. I said it back in my week four video, Something is wrong with Joe Flacco, and it hasn't gotten better. Baltimore is statistically the worst passing offense in the NFL. Their running game is okay, but it's only just good enough to put them at 31st out of 32 for overall offense. That's how bad they are at passing the ball. In their last three games, Flacco has thrown for three touchdowns combined, and only one of those three was for more than three yards. Basically a handoff at that point. The Baltimore defense is strong, of course, I'm not trying to take that away from them, but they haven't exactly been facing competent quarterbacks with Brett Hundley and Tom Savage as their last two opponents. And even Savage put up some points. So can they keep pace with Detroit, with Matt Stafford? I don't think so. Unless the Baltimore defense can score points themselves, I think the Lions win ugly, and if you're gonna give me two and a half points, 
That makes it even better because I'm taking the Lions to win. In 2016, Tom Brady served a silly suspension for ball pressure. While he was gone, NFL experts actually started to talk about how maybe now was the time for New England to look to the future, to think about trading him while he still had some value. And the reason that they were talking about trading away the greatest quarterback in NFL history because they thought they had the next one. Jimmy Garoppolo, the backup quarterback who came in and played the first game and half of the second game while Brady was away on suspension, was so good in six quarters of football that it honestly had people on ESPN radio discussing whether or not he should get to keep the starting job even when Brady was back from suspension, which seems insane to say after, of course, they went on to win the Super Bowl. In six quarters, he threw for almost 500 yards and four touchdowns combined before an injury put him on the shelf and forced Jacoby Brissett to come in. Luckily, that didn't last long. Brady came back and it's a whole fairy tale thing. And after all that, nobody talked about Jimmy G again. He was hurt, then Brady was doing his thing, and it was like he got forgotten about. Of course, that is until this year at the trade deadline when San Francisco pulled the plug on a trade to bring him into the fold. Now, when they made the trade, San Fran had zero wins and zero hope of really getting any, so it seemed like they were bringing Jimmy G in with the idea of re-signing him to a long-term contract and then they could look at him being their guy going forward but until then they wanted to try out CJ Beathard. Beathard got him a win and nothing else. At the end of a game against Seattle last week Beathard got hurt so in comes Jimmy Garoppolo only for three plays mind you but in those three plays he had a rush for four yards and two passes one for a touchdown totaling over 20 yards. So there's your completely unnecessary history of Jimmy Garoppolo in the NFL. Why did I do it? Because that's entirely the reason why I think this is San Francisco's second win of the year. That vaunted Chicago defense let Philly run up 31 points. Detroit put up 27 a couple weeks ago. Hell, even Green Bay with Brett Hundley in his first starting game put up 23. If the legend of Jimmy G is real, and I think it's real enough for this game, San Francisco could and should be looking at win number two this season and really starting to get some momentum going where this might be a team to watch next year. Or maybe I'm getting way too ahead of myself for an unproven backup quarterback. But Chicago is 0-3-1 against the spread in their last four games, so that's just icing on the cake. I'm going to take San Francisco, you're going to give me three and a half points, and I'm going to pick them to win. Pool's time, and this week I'm going with Miami and Oakland at home, New England and Philly on the road, and I'm going to take both LA teams to win, which if it happens would be only the fourth time this season that both LA teams have won in the same week. Which is mostly the Bolts' fault that that's not higher. So who do you got? Let me know in the comments down below, or hit me with a message on Instagram, on Twitter, or on Facebook. Facebook. I want to hear from you. I want to see your card. You guys have been sending me some great winners so far. Some of you using my picks, some of you disagreeing, and that's what this is all about. I'm giving you what I think is my best opinion, but if you've got a different idea, I want to hear from it. So again, comment down below the video and tell me who you like this week and who you think I'm crazy for picking. Then hit the links in the description so that you can get all the cards and games and all the stuff yourself, and let me know how you do when we come on Monday. I'm your pal Dolby, thank you for watching. Make sure that you subscribe and hit the bell for notifications and I'll see you in week 14. If you wanna make sure that you're getting all the line spreads and game lists before anybody else, you gotta be an MVP. Follow the link in the description of this video to sign up with WCLC to get alerts, notifications, and emails directly to you with everything that you need to play.